Victor is going to talk about cryptocurrency, botnets, and all these other neat buzzwords that you hear, and actually make some sense out of it, or he's going to pretend to, one or the other. Uh, we'll see him uh, for 30 minutes, and then you can heckle him. Thanks, sir. All right. Let's see. Yeah, it looks like we're right on time. All right. Who here has a drink right now? All right, got a few. So I just want to give a cheers to Alchemy Security and Joe for letting us crash their office for the day. Thank you, guys. All right. There he is. It's Joe. Well, so uh, today what I want to talk to you guys about is this uh, botnet campaign we've been uh, we've been tracking for a little bit and. Uh, what kind of made this turn into something actually interesting that I think uh, was worth at least putting some slides together around? Um, so let's uh, let's jump right in. I'm gonna go fast. I have to trim like a ton of shit out because I have 30 minutes. So uh, we'll see if we even have time for questions, but I'll be around later. Um, so there's some stuff like ways that we acquired some of this information that we have to talk about offline. So uh, we'll see when we get to Q&A time. Uh -huh. What? So uh, I'll introduce myself. My name is uh, Greg Foss. I'm a principal threat researcher with Carbon Black, uh, part of the threat analysis unit. We do a lot of uh, tracking of botnets. We build all the queries that you see within the uh, whole pro the uh, whole Carbon Black product line. Um, we do a lot of attack simulation as well. So anyone in here hear of the uh, botnet known as Smallman Room? It's kind of an interesting one, a little esoteric. It's not too much too present in the United States. Kind of predominantly you know, Russia, APAC kind of area. So, but it is now branching into the States, so now we're actually seeing a lot more of it here. So Small Monroe is kind of interesting, right? This is not a, a new botnet by any means. This is one that kind of came out you know, late 2016, mid-2017. Uh, tons of write-ups around this kind of you know since that time frame. From then up until uh, currently, like there was just a new write up that just came out, I want to say about a week ago, by uh, Tread Micro, they found some new data. Uh, but predominantly, what this is, is a crypto mining botnet. They're just running XM rig and mining for cryptocurrency on compromised Windows systems. So, what's interesting about that, right? When we were first looking into this, all the intelligence that was out there just pointed to this being a basic commodity crypto miner. Uh, you know, they talked a little bit about the ability to spread uh, using Eternal Blue, uh, which is kind of the most advanced part we came across before we actually really dug into this. But uh, they didn't cover some of the really kind of unique things that we found about this botnet that made it uh, kind of more concerning. So I just wanted to highlight a couple of write-ups that are already out there, because they're actually really good. It just was like through the evolution of this campaign. And to this day, they're still evolving this campaign and expanding it in order to infect additional hosts and just expand their overall reach and income, essentially. So why should we care, right? Why should we care if this is a crypto miner versus you know, something that's actually like leveraging the theft of information or something like that? Well, because companies are going to handle these threats differently. So if you send someone a notification, so you know, working at Carbon Black, we're essentially a vendor that does endpoint security. So we see all these different companies and how they handle their threats in various different ways. So if we tell them, oh, this is just like a PUA, like a potentially unwanted application, a crypto miner, they're just like, cool, like uninstall it and move on. But the thing is, and why I think this is important for you to really understand, like looking at the whole aspect of how these systems become infected and what else comes in terms of like tertiary payloads, related to these, these uh, pieces of malware is the fact that this is actually doing a lot of low bin attacks. It's using a lot of uh, built-in Windows system components to maintain persistence, expand the reach into both the organization and just the systems they've compromised. And so it's a lot more to clean up than just say removing the crypto miner that's very obvious uh, with this. So when we first came across this, uh, we actually just had a customer and we were doing a deployment and the customer uh, rolled out Carbon Black Defense and this flag, and we're like, oh sweet, we you know we caught a miner. But what was weird was just all the other stuff we saw this thing doing. There was a lot of other activities that we were, we were picking up from this, and we're like, is this just the miner or not? Because we actually saw different actors using the same C2 networks to interact with this host. So 
kind of interesting. Um, so first we thought this was like a drive-by download or something, how they got infected. We later find, found out that they were actually using SMB and WMI respectively to do spreading uh, across the, uh, both over the internet and both within the LAN once they get inside a company. Um, so the initial dropper establishes persistence via multiple different uh, mechanisms that we'll dive into a little bit here. Uh, but essentially, you know, they're using uh, squiggly do, using register 32, run DLL 32, all these built-in Windows system components to establish persistence to multiple different C2 servers. Uh, they also did DNS poisoning. They did that so that they could fake out, you know, analysts when we were going to look up hosts and stuff and resolve to something else and throw us off the trail. Um, and they did all these things just to make sure they were maintaining this access and also maintaining the uh, privileged access to certain processes on the host. Um, crypto mining, of course, they're just using XMRIG, something we see very common uh, with a lot of the miners out there. Um, and for those of you that don't know, that don't know XMRIG is a very popular uh, Monero cryptocurrency miner. And the reason it's so popular with malware is it uses the CPU. So you infect hundreds of thousands of hosts and just mine using the CPU, you can actually get a lot of uh, revenue from that. Um, and they're also using Eternal Blue to spread laterally, move within the organizations and spread across the internet as well. Um, and one of the real interesting things here is we saw different uh, people from Russia and China actually leveraging this backend access uh, to actually do post exploitation activities on these hosts. And it's kind of interesting, we'll get into that in a bit, but uh, what this turned into is actually a much larger, uh, what's known as a botnet spreader. So it's like one of these services where you can rent malware or services and actually purchase access into organizations. And we'll break down kind of that, that whole backend as well. So just another crypto or commodity miner? No, definitely not a commodity miner. Um, so they're using a lot of living off the land attacks for persistence, uh, provision remote access in multiple ways. Um, they would also, you know, if they compromise the server uh, over the internet, they would immediately implement firewall rules to block all that access so no one else could come in after them. They also had an initial process of killing off every competing miner that was out there. They had this whole list of files that was constantly updated, they would check, and they would just kill these off and make sure that they were blacklisted on this host going forward. So only their mining software would actually be able to run. Um, and the real interesting part is uh, the theft of sensitive data. We'll get into that in more detail in a bit. Um, but multiple C2s, DNS poisoning, all that kind of fun stuff. Now, who are they primarily going after? Mostly Russia. We saw a lot of people in India, China, kind of all over the place. Uh, not so much in the United States at this time. So this is uh, from Proof, Proofpoint, and this was back about a year ago they gathered this data. Uh, so this has now expanded quite a bit to actually include a lot of uh, United States. So they're starting to spread and continuing to kind of evolve their, their whole coverage. Now what's interesting with this in terms of like why these other write-ups didn't include a lot of the details that we found when we were doing our analysis, it looks like, so we came up with a few different kind of scenarios that line up with what's happened both with this campaign, within the news, within the cryptocurrency industry, that, that kind of lead to why they've looked at expanding into different revenue streams using the same malware. So on the top here, you can see the value of Monero over time. So this is starting in uh, 2016, beginning of 2016 to July of this, of this year. And you can see Monero shot up for a while. It was kind of at their peak there. Um, but the uh, actual small Monroe campaign has been active for a while, really kicked off in like early 2017. Um, and at the point where they got about like halfway through their mining operation, um, an ISP actually caught on to what they were doing and was able to sinkhole one third of their entire mining traffic. So all of a sudden they lost this massive amount of revenue, right? Up to this point, they had mined uh, over 8,000 uh, Monero. Uh, upwards of, at the time, worth about $3 million. So they made quite a bit of money just for mining. But at that same time, you see the price of Monero starts to dip. They were just sinkhole. Uh, all of a sudden, you know, maybe that's when they decided to shift tactics and start adding in the theft of information and resale of that data as another kind of tactic to uh, kind of expand their empire. But another interesting aspect here, you see my kings. Anyone hear of uh, my kings before? My, my Kings is a pretty massive campaign. And so this is actually, this is actually a uh, botnet spreader 
So this is one of these services where you can actually rent out and buy, you know, malware that's existing in companies. Um, we ended up dubbing this uh, essentially access mining, where you just buy your way into organizations. Uh, this is a great place to do that. It's through the whole MyKings uh, kind of network. And what's interesting is we actually found a link between these two campaigns that actually shows that the guys who created Small Monroe actually were the founders of MyKings as well. So we're able to definitely link them together. It's kind of interesting. So you will care. You will care about this. <laughs> So what I, what I wanted to show you guys is just a high level overview of like, this is actually everything that this one piece of malware is doing once it infects your system. Now we're not gonna break down all of this because I only have 30 minutes, but it's crazy, right? There's a lot of shit. So I'm gonna do uh, some highlights. We'll, we'll just take a look at a couple of the, the fun stuff once this gift is over. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna to play all the way through. <laughs> All right, so some highlights, right? So Small Monroe, the funny thing about this, like the, uh, as we looked at this, every you know, couple of days they were changing the names of binaries, they're changing the hashes. Uh, every single system you infect is updated with new hashes. So like you can't use signature detection to stop this. It's something where there's too many like different types of payloads and different methods that they've implemented to infect systems that it was something where we have to look at you know, actual behavioral uh, techniques and look into what they're actually doing. So the arsenal, a lot of this was PowerShell. Uh, and the funny thing about all the PowerShell they're using, none of it's encoded. They're, there's one piece that's an encoded PowerShell command, and it's a straight WMI event subscription creation. Everything else is like plain text, and it's like they're not even trying to hide. Like these guys do not care at all. Um, one of the things they do that's kind of interesting is uh, they repurpose a lot of existing binaries, both for malware, miners, or uh, existing uh, Windows system components, like uh, Cackles, Podhost. They uh, ended up bringing their own versions of these files and switching them out on the, on the core OS. Um, and we'll talk about kind of more what those are used for in a bit. Uh, but these Mimikatz, both the binary version and the PowerShell version, um, and then Eternal Loop. Um, a lot of crypto miners, you know, some, sometimes they would actually change the crypto miners or they would induce like weird stuff, like inject in other processes and mine it from that. Um, but a lot of this came back to, at the end of the day, it was started with PowerShell and ended with PowerShell and BB scripts. And that's how they did their uh, data collection and exfiltration. So what does this look like when you initially get infected? This is the initial command line that you'll see on an endpoint that's getting infected with the small end of the malware. Uh, this is what it looks like when it comes in via internal blue. So someone scans the host, gains access, immediately ex executes this command. And we actually got a hold of their actual uh, original payloads that they were using. And uh, so we'll show that in a little bit here. Um, but that first command there, that's just creating that WMI event subscription. And so they're trying to do this very first thing, establish that persistence, make sure they have a way back into the system. Uh, these next couple scripts, a lot of them just pull down different lists of files for other miners that they want to kill, other uh, you know, pieces of data that they're kind of interested in collecting. Um, so they all have very specific jobs, and every time you run this, these will be updated as well. So it'll pull from different hosts, these are changing kind of constantly. Um, so that's what those uh, next like download string kind of sections are, are highlighting. But then at the bottom when you see register 32 that's using uh, the squibbly do method to establish persistence to, in this case, three different uh, C2 servers. So we pull those down and, and ran them. And it's funny because they're not stages, like it says one, two, three. They're just literally like different C2s that it's pulling back to after it establishes persistence. So this first stage, after some of the binaries that are actually dropped once the PowerShell executes, um, are these three files, which are kind of the key here. And now at this point, these names of these files have changed. Um, so you know, it's something where every week we're kind of running through this and they're modifying, you know, which these files are. But uh, Max, at the time, uh, this one would just go and uh, overwrite the master boot record. So when we were detonating this within our uh, VMs, we were finding it was crashing and it was due to this. So we had to actually test this on some bare metal just to make sure we got the full telemetry of what was happening here. 
Um, I'm going to skip over US UPS, uh, UPX for a second. Uh, but U.exe is kind of a secondary, uh, secondary payload that did a lot of the DNS poisoning. And it routed traffic, so as you're making requests, they would actually go through uh, U.exe or it would inject into another process. So it would control you know, what you were, you were able to do lookups on. But uh, this one is the fun one. This uh, UPS UPX is like kind of where all of the other magic comes from. This is like the core binary that delivers everything else that ended up being more interesting uh, in terms of like what we have time to talk about here. Uh, the mining itself turned out to be actually the um, like most innocuous part of this whole thing. So what's funny is this miner actually sleeps for 14 hours after every time you move the mouse. So they want to wait until you're definitely asleep, or you're definitely not touching this host before it uh, clicks on. And once you remote into the host or you, you know, move the mouse or something like that, it immediately stops, kills the process, and just disappears entirely um, until, until the next time it starts up again. Now the squiggly do uh, remote access here. This is just an example of one of these, uh, one of the, pay the pages that is being called by this piece of malware. So as you can see here, we're just running wscript shell via command.exe to use jscript to run all of our code here, which is just shell code, shoveling a shell out. And this they set up to run on jobs. This runs just scheduled over time, kind of maintaining that access over time. So, by the way, if you're looking for good detections, anytime you see JScript running anything like PowerShell or Command.exe running JScript, that's a solid indicator right there. Um, but the next interesting thing is the eternal blue aspect. So, any of you here play around with the open source, you know, after the Shadow Brokers leak and all the, all the tools came out and everything. So, this is one of those uh, repositories that kind of made some modifications to the tool set, made it work a little easier. But, um, but essentially, they, all they did was cloned uh, this GitHub repo and added their own, uh, their own post ex exploitation code to, uh, to the actual Eternal Blue uh, payloads. So this is what it actually looks like. Um, so everything in here you see is exactly as it is within the GitHub, except for this part. So right here is just basically the commands the script that are going to execute once you actually successfully exploit the system using Eternal Blue. So over here, uh, if you want to read through this, I can, I can uh, send this to you later. But essentially, this is just running everything that we saw initially. Um, you know, setting up the WMI persistence, establishing persistence on the host, uh, basically making sure that they have a really good foothold into this host before delivering delivering the remaining uh, malware. Now where this gets really interesting and where we started having a little too much fun with this is what gets into the part about uh, what we, we ended up calling is uh, access mining. So what access mining is, is essentially when you steal data from a host, so say you compromise this host, steal the usernames, passwords, domain information, um, or direct access to the host, and then you take that data, push it up to a deep web market, and actually sell it directly. So you can go out and buy direct access into an organization, you can buy credentials into a company. Some of these are even just straight RDP open to the internet, and we'll, we'll show a couple of those in a bit. Um, but they also do a lot of math across these and look at you know, how they're going to price these when they sell them. So they will sell hosts for different values depending on the speed. You know, is this a, a fast um, server? You know, what's the processing? What's the network throughput? Is this in a target organization? Some of those go for thousands of dollars. Um, so this uh, piece of malware, the piece that's kind of highlighted here, uh, what they actually what it actually does is script uh, called s.ps1, will PowerShell script, goes out and it downloads s.txt, which contains all the WMI persistence kind of mechanisms, runs that, and then uh, it goes and downloads that l.txt, kills all the processes listed within that, and then it downloads uh, and executes the script called up.txt. Now what up.txt does is it just collects information on the host gathers credentials, domain information, all that kind of stuff, and then it uploads it via FTP, just directly uh, over FTP, so all your creds are going over plain text, so extra fun. 
Uh, but here's actually what that script looks like. It's funny, they didn't obfuscate any of this. So when we're taking a look at this, it's pretty straightforward, right? They're looking at what's your external IP, what are the processes running on your host, and this is after they've killed them as well. Uh, you know, fingerprinting the OS, what version of Windows are you running, calculate the memory capacity, which could be key for, you know, how they're going to price this later, uh, list CPU information, uh, basically, you know, is this going to be a good system for mining, is this something we want to use for something else? Um, but then it gets more fun, so this is the second half of the script here. So, right here, anyone recognize this? Will power exploit baby cats? So just directly pulled down from their GitHub and, and executed. Then here, they're just basically writing all this data to a raw text file. And then here is where they upload over FTP. You know, didn't see anything interesting here about the FTP part? Yeah. <laughs> so like, it's funny, these guys do not give a fuck, right? They, they are just running this. They don't care if we find it, if someone else finds it. Like, tons of people are guaranteed monitoring these guys um, on top of us. Um, so, you know, it's just kind of funny to see how, how open they are. Because a lot of these attacks we focus on are really trying to, you know, understand how they're trying to hide, how they're using encoding and stuff like that to, to evade. But just in our monitoring of this, we found over 100,000 uh, unique infections from this one FTP server. Now this was one FTP server out of six at the time. So there, there are multiple of these going to different locations, all uploading data in the same way. Now when we looked at some of the other research that was out there, my button will work. There we go. So we found over 500,000 unique infections just within a week of, of monitoring this. So you can see how, how actually pretty large this campaign is um, for being such a simple kind of piece of malware for, for what they're doing. Uh, but this really gets back to like, you know, when you have these potentially unwanted applications and things like that that you may not view as a big deal on your network, you do really want to think about it as like, you know, is this doing something else that I don't know about? What happened when this was loaded onto my system? You know, you want to get that whole attack chain to understand and really make sure that you're not letting other aspects kind of slip by. Because um, with this case, a lot of the people that, that we've talked to about this one in particular, uh, basically just went and deleted the binaries, but still had all the uh, existing pers persistence mechanisms in place. So something that was just completely missed. So, so Jesus says you should care. You should care about what kind of malware you have. Um, but so, that's not stopping there. I want to go into mapping out the infrastructure of these guys. Um, so this is the part I can't, I can't show kind of everything because we're actually still uh, actively uh, doing some fun stuff with these guys. But I'll cover the stuff that's kind of out there already. Um, so this is one of the FTP servers. Uh, we're looking at just the histor historical data around this FTP server and a lot of their other infrastructure that we found. Uh, initially, we were thinking this was actually a Chinese campaign because we saw a lot of Chinese malware, uh, you know, within the yeah, exif data and some of the, the binaries we were looking at, and just some of the communications we saw on the back end that that we may or may not have, have gotten into. Uh, but essentially, we it's kind of interesting because this is actually uh, just a compromised server we found out. This is one where, you know, this is one of many servers they took over and they just started assigning their own DNS entries to these compromised servers in order to maintain their, their persistence. Um, so once we started pulling these domains down and looking at, you know, what was the commonalities between them, we actually found this one, which is kind of interesting, uh, billkillmenow at gmail.com. So this address, if you do any research on this, you'll actually see they're tied to a lot of interesting stuff out there including, uh, so not just the Small Monroe uh, campaign, but they're also tied to My Kings, which My Kings is a lot bigger. This is where it's actually getting into, you know, Russian, much larger, uh, na you know, nation state level kind of campaigns. Uh, and so, you know, tying these together is kind of interesting. We're actually able to find a gap in the historical registration for uh, one of these domains. So mykings.pw used to be one of their main primary domains. They handle a lot of the kind of coordination among all of their other, uh, all the other mykings uh, kind of work. 
Um, you can see a bunch of these other ones are actually still active, but uh, MyKings.pw is kind of the main one. Um, what was funny is they actually, the guy actually let, uh, let their private registration expire at one point, and so they had this gap and they actually got their email associated. The funny thing too, quickly after this, they switched and all of a sudden now it's under a mail.ru address. So as soon as they saw this was exposed, they switched it and now it's still a private register again. Um, so we decided to switch to phone numbers. So phone numbers are fun when you're trying to pivot across and see who owns a domain. Um, all of these came back to uh, the same Russian phone number, which is kind of weird, right? Like it's not something that's even validated when you create a domain, so why do something that you have to actually, they use the same across everything else. For whatever reason these guys did. How many? It's a lot, a lot of domains. These are all the, the names associated with each of these. Um, so this is the phone number, it's a Russian phone number. Um, that's associated with all these registrants of domains. And it's funny, they use the same phone number, but then they use names like NA or ASDF and stuff like that. So it's, like, it's just kind of funny that that they would keep the same phone number. So I don't know. Uh, uh, we should we should call it now, right? How much does that cost to call Russia? I don't know. <laughs> uh, but then there's the IPs. So these are all the IPs that are associated with that same domain. So kind of interesting, right? So where does this go? This goes to a Moscow taxi company. So owned by this bear, that's for sure. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> like it. Um, and this is what it looks like. There's like a little train station behind there and stuff. So, so I don't know. It's just kind of weird that they all decided to use the same uh, same connection. We did find some other stuff that I'd be glad to talk to you about over beers later. But um, but for now, we we'll just keep it to, to what's out there. Um, so the physical location of these, the ones that are actually owned by the adversary. We're all uh, based in Russia. Um, the other ones that we found all ended up being compromised assets. So they were all servers that, you know, within the United States, they've taken over quite a few hosts. They're mostly uh, IAS servers, and they were just going out popping these servers and then deploying either FTP or their own web servers to them to handle different aspects of the overall C2. Um, the other aspect that's kind of interesting, so Bill Kill Me Now is kind of the main email address that's associated with this campaign. We also found uh, this one that's associated with almost all of the My Kings ones, but not the Swamin ones, which is kind of interesting. So this is a Vlad Ivankov at 86 at mail.ru, kind of an interesting one. Um, and that one, we can talk about that later too. It's a fun one. But um, so access mining marketplaces. Anyone here hang out like on, on deep web and like have run into any of these kind of places? So, so this one right here, what you're looking at is a login form to a uh, remote desktop protocol shop. So what they're selling here is just direct access into systems that are compromised uh, over RDP. So a lot of these would come in the form of credentials. Some, they just give you an actual login form. One of these we found, they actually use a guacamole to so like, go through their web interface and like log in to their, their server. Like it's pretty legit. It's like better than some commercial stuff that's out there. Um, this is what the actual page looks like, like where you buy access to these, to these systems. Um, so over here you see the uh, IP, and actually when you purchase, you'll get the full IP. They won't show it to you until, because they don't want you to just go pop it yourself. Um, and it shows the country, it shows the state, uh, city, uh, zip code even. Um, it shows the OS, RAM, the speed, all that kind of stuff. And then it's all priced accordingly based on all right, I got 30 seconds. 29. 29 seconds. Oh, shit. <laughs> so over, overall, we saw a majority of these are about $5 a host. But there are some, you know, kind of in the middle range, like $12 or so seem to be kind of average for like a pretty decent host for getting access to. And this is across all of the access mining marketplaces, not just uh, the RDP one. So it's kind of interesting. Um, but over time, we're seeing this steadily increase in terms of the amount of systems that are available and the uh, price. So it's definitely something that we're seeing kind of growing in terms of a service, a uh, service offering, if you will. Um, but the very last piece I wanted to touch on is what they're actually doing with the cryptocurrency and how they're laundering it. 
Any of you here play around with uh, tumblers, Bitcoin tumblers and stuff like that? Well, I chose this one to highlight because this one's specific for uh, Monero. So basically, this uses pre laundered coins. You can push Monero to this, you can push Bitcoin, um, and then you can get different types of coins out of it. So it makes it really easy to launder this money. So it's kind of one of the ways you can, you can shuffle the coins through, push it down to a clean wallet, transfer it over to another wallet, and actually take money out. Now, of course, there's stuff like chain analysis, and, and I'm told to stop, so. <laughs> um, but that's it. That's about it, so. All right. Any, any questions? All right, perfect. I'm going to keep going. So. <laughs> um, but basically, long story short, like, it's hard to condense all of this down. This was originally, like, a couple-hour uh, briefing that we went through. But essentially, all of this is rapidly changing. It shows kind of that need to really focus on, you know, it may just come off as a PUA or adware or something like that, but oftentimes it has all these ulterior motives associated with it that can make it more profitable for the person who owns the botnet. So you definitely want to look into all of these things and treat them all kind of with the same level of effort. Um, so that's kind of the main, the main point here. Uh, but if you want to read more about this, we actually have, uh, we put out a threat intelligence notification on this. Uh, we have some posts on our uh, customer portal as well that go into like some of the queries and things that can find this activity. And then we have a, a white paper that talks more about the larger aspect of access mining in general. With that, thank you.